Hi, I'm John. And I'm Hunter. And we're MTB Dev. Today, we're going to talk about springs. So, I actually really like this shock. It's got a coil spring on it, um, but it seems a little bit heavy. And I don't know if the spring rate's quite right for me. So, if it's just a spring rate, Hunter, you can actually go on to mtb.dev and use our coil spring calculator to select the right uh, spring rate for your bike and rider setup. Oh, cool. However, if you're concerned about the weight or adjustability, you might want to try out an air spring. Uh, this is the same shock as that, except uh, it just has a, an air spring uh, instead of a coil. So if it's an air spring, I mean, lighter weight, more adjustable, why don't I always want to go with this shock over that one? So air springs have a few really interesting design challenges. Uh, the most notable is that they have a really high breakaway force. So with a coil, uh, in order to initiate force, essentially all you have to do is overcome the preload uh, on the coil. Uh, but with an air spring, uh, that preload is actually the amount of charge, the amount of positive pressure that you have in the chamber while it's at rest. And uh, so if, you, if this was just sitting at rest and had all the positive pressure in there and nothing else it would you'd have to overcome a few hundred pounds of force in order to get it to move right but there's got to be something else in there though because i've noticed that you know the air shocks aren't taking 200 pounds of force to start the travel how does that happen so modern air shocks actually have some sort of negative spring to help initiate travel Okay. Now, one way that that has been done is by using an actual spring uh, on the back, and it helps to push against that air pressure and start the spring moving. Um, gotcha. The negative springs uh, had the same drawback as coil springs in that they're heavy and uh, lacked adjustability. So if I wanted to change that, could I just change up my spring rate, or was I really out of luck if my negative spring wasn't set up for me? Essentially, you were out of luck in those circumstances. Uh, if you weren't 175 pounds, you did have a bad ride. So if I ate a burger, I'm good. <laughs> That's right. Nice. So, so as shocks evolved, uh, we started using air on the back. Okay. So yeah, I think we drew up something earlier just to kind of demonstrate that. Uh, is this kind of what it looks like? We've got positive pressure here and pushing down on the piston. And then we've got our negative air pressure here pushing up on the piston. And then like a little bit of the shaft force, you know, from actually riding the bike, compressing it. But how, what, do you, what do you think about this? Absolutely. So we've got, we've got uh, these pressures, the positive and negative, are really close to being balanced. So that just a small amount of force from the shaft is required to initiate travel. Not much more. Uh, and that, that gives us a real spring-like feel off the top. So how do they always get balanced if I put 200 PSI just in the one valve? So older shocks actually did have uh, two different air ports and you'd have uh, air in, for the positive and you'd charge that up for your sag and then air for the negative and you'd charge that up to balance the positive. But that was pretty difficult to set up. That seems like a lot of work. It kind of personally prefer the set and forget method, even though I know we're trying to explain a lot of the uh, extra details needed to tune your own stuff, though. So, Fox and Rock Shocks are way ahead of you on that. Okay. They actually created a self-equalizing chamber. And we have an example of that right here, although it is in this shock as well. If you look closely, there's a little bump on this shock. Right. That is where the uh, negative and the positive equalize. So as the piston passes that, it connects both of the chambers together and equalizes the air in between them. So you always have the correct amount of negative air pressure as positive. Wow, that's actually pretty cool because it uh, sounds really easy for the user. It is. Um, so basically we've got uh, a couple disadvantages with the air spring. We're always trying to get the linear feel of the coil shock right, and kind of our negative air spring is really helping us with that. Um, we can look at these graphs and kind of see 
how the negative air spring makes the overall spring curve more linear because um, it's pretty complicated just to, to visualize you know how those two are going to interact. The blue line represents the contribution of the positive chamber whereas the orange dotted line represents the contribution of the negative chamber. The sum of these two is the total spring rate represented here with a red dotted line. Um, and then even more so, what happens when we change the volume of the negative air spring? I mean, that's, that matters a lot, doesn't it? Absolutely. So here we have uh, the same air spring size okay. uh, with different negative air spring sizes. Okay. Uh, so this is a standard volume negative spring. Uh, this is the transfer port right here. Gotcha. And uh, so the negative air volume is very, very small here. You can see it's it's not much once you account for the uh, wiper seal. Okay. Whereas this, you can see a really pronounced bump. We're not counting this. This is where a different seal sits. Okay. Uh, so we take this out again, and then we have this bump right here. Right. Uh, and that adds uh, extra negative volume to it. Okay, so is that going to make it feel a little more linear? So yeah, uh, that allows the negative spring to influence the stroke for a longer period of time. Okay. So on some shocks, they actually have to use negative volume spacers. Even though it's beneficial to have a larger negative volume, yeah. having a negative volume spacer is required because of the design constraints of where the transfer port has to go. Okay, so... This has been a really good explanation of kind of like what the negative air spring is doing. It's it's really getting that breakaway force to be lower. Um, it's somewhat helping us create a more linear overall spring rate. Absolutely. Um, but why do we want the linear spring rate? I mean, is that just a predictability thing? So it's predictability, but it's it's also the harshness. So as okay. you move through the travel, if uh, you have that traditional wallowy feeling in the middle of the air spring, then uh, you're going to end up towards the, the lower end of your, your uh, more compressed state of your shock. And then all of a sudden it's gonna ramp up really hard right at the end and it's gonna be harsh. Whereas if it's, if it's very linear through the middle and gives you that support, you're gonna have more shock to go through when you need it. So it's not gonna be gotcha. as harsh. So I'm actually using the travel of my shock and it's it's helping me. Exactly. Okay. One other thing that's uh, that's not exactly intuitive is that you have to have good mid-stroke support in order to have a truly progressive shock. If you look at this chart right here, it shows that a wallowy midsection where it flattens out and it looks progressive is actually it ends up in the same spot as this coil spring. However, if you support the mid-stroke, then you can create a ramp up after that that resists bottom out while still providing that mid-stroke support. I'm sure engineers are working hard to make that the case for most of the shocks out there now. That's the goal. Cool deal. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's been great talking to you about negative air springs. As always, feel free to like our video, comment, or subscribe, and head to our website, mtb.dev, for all sorts of useful information and some calculators to help you set up your bike.